I don't know if you saw it this morning in the news or last night in the news, but um, China and Russia are cooperating together in the Pacific, uh, running warships. I don't want you to panic, uh, but it's something to be concerned about. And when you think about that in the backdrop of the book of Habakkuk, you say, my goodness, this 2600 year old book that is as relevant as today. Now, Habakkuk does not talk about China, does not talk about Russia, uh, but it does talk about dealing with antagonistic situations, and it talks about God's justice and God's fairness in the world, and how we sometimes think it's so unfair that God would use an evil nation to judge what might be perhaps uh, a more peaceful nation. And that's beyond our understanding often, and that was the question that Habakkuk had. That was one of his complaints before God in this little three-chapter book. We said, Habakkuk is a prophet for our times, for the questions of our times. And in chapter one, we looked at some of Habakkuk's questions and complaints. We won't go back there. Uh, you can look at the, the video on our website. But in chapter two today, we're going to look at the Lord's answer to Habakkuk's complaint. Sometimes when you have a prayer and you pray that prayer over and over again and you say, God, why are you not answering it? And then God comes back and he gives you an answer and it's not the answer that you think you want. Uh, we've all had that experience. And so Habakkuk was no different. It's not the answer he wanted. And here's basically what God says in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, it shall come to pass. Well, what? What shall come to pass? He's saying to Habakkuk, yes, I know that you don't like the fact that your nation, Judah, down there around Jerusalem, those two tribes have disobeyed God, have walked away from God, have embraced foreign gods, and many of the prophets would cry out and say, God, why are you not dealing with the uh, mistakes, the sins, the failures of your people? And you might say that about our country. You might say, you might look at the politics, you might look at the situation in our country, and Habakkuk is very much up to date for our country, and say, why is there so much graft and corruption? Why is there so much wrong in our world? Why, why does our world seem to be upside down? In fact, uh, Isaiah was the one who said, you know, the times will come when we will call the truth a lie and the lie truth. And I think we're at those times that a lot of what you hear sometimes on the news, you know flat out, it's, it's just not true. There's something in your gut that tells you. Things that are wrong, things that are evil, things that are uh, against the standards of our culture are happening all over and people, you know, they either applaud it or sadly they film it. And we've had experience uh, with that just this, this past weekend where a crime was being committed and instead of anybody calling 911, instead of anybody, and this happened right in Philadelphia, anyone doing anything about it, they pulled out their cell phones and they decided to videotape this crime. Now fortunately there are other places and other times where justice is being done, but it's gonna frustrate Christians in particular. And the answer that God gives to Habakkuk is, it's going to happen. It shall come to pass. Let me see what he's talking about. And then he talks with that about the five woes that are announced on the proud in chapter 2, verses 5 through 20. We will not get to those until next week. So God is saying, I will judge. I will evaluate evil nations. I will evaluate warring nations that, that are against my will. And Babylon was the nation he was talking about at the time. And he pronounces five woes on them. We'll get to that next week, but I wanted you to see that's in chapter 2. But let me give you just the highlight. Woe to him who increases what is not his. See if this is familiar in our culture. We, we honor greed. We honor uh, things that are uh, just, just corrupt as can be. And God says, woe to the person who basically 
steals and cheats and lies and robs to get what he wants or what she wants. Woe to him who covets evil gain. Same kind of concept in chapter 2, verse 9 and 11. We'll look at these next week in detail. Woe to him who builds a town with evil um, by using evil means, by using corruption. And they basically build a name for themselves and they build a town and they build a, a, a reputation. Woe to him who gives his neighbor drink. Now, the Babylonians were known as drinkers. They were known as, as really, in fact, if you, if you look at the judgment in Daniel, when the handwriting comes on the wall, what were they doing? What, were, what was Nebuchadnezzar and, um, and uh, the Babylonians, what were they doing? They're throwing a big drunken party. That's what they were doing. So they had a reputation for that. And at times, to defeat another nation, you would take a leader and basically, you know, you would get them drunk. And so he says, woe to him who gives his neighbor drink for the purpose of ruining his life. Woe to him who speaks to idols, who worships idols instead of the living God. So there are the five woes. Now Habakkuk takes his stand to hear from God in chapter 2 and verse 1. And here's what... He says, chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. Now, did he actually go up onto a wall of a building and, and say, God, I'm going to stand here? Uh, a rampart was usually a, a, a place of safety, a place of defense. And did he go and, and do that? Well, we don't know that he did that. This might have been an attitude, uh, a mindset that he had. But he says, I'll stand my watch and station myself on the ramparts at some secure place, and I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am, I, I am to give to this complaint. Now, it's interesting because we don't know whether that's God's answer about Habakkuk's complaint or whether it's Habakkuk's response to what God's going to say about his complaint. But they're having a dialogue. I told you that Habakkuk is a little different from other prophets, particularly the minor prophets. The other prophets, they are addressing nations. They are addressing peoples. They are addressing the nation of Israel or the, the little tribe of Judah, uh, the northern tribes or the southern tribes. But Habakkuk is not doing that. He's having an argument with God. He's having a dialogue with God about things. And so he says, I'm gonna stand here and God, you answer me. Um, you know, if you or I did that, wouldn't you expect the lightning to strike? I mean, wouldn't you kind of think, well, well that's pretty bold. Habakkuk had a, a relationship with God that God honored. I, I don't understand this sometimes. We have situations where in the Old Testament, someone like Gideon is one of the judges and he's, he's testing God and he's throwing out a fleece. We've heard the story of Gideon's fleece from the book of Judges. And God honors that. He says, God, I have a question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And he puts the, the, the sheep fleece out there. And he says, you know, uh, if you answer my prayer this way, have dew be on the fleece in, the, in the, uh, the next day. And then he reverses and he says, don't have any dew on the fleece, have the dew all be on the ground. And God honored that. And I think, most of it has to do with their heart. Gideon had a good, clear heart. Habakkuk had a good, clear heart. There are other times where God says, you know, stop testing me. You're testing me. And it, and it may have to do with God's patience and the attitude of our heart. So apparently there was a relationship enough that Habakkuk could take his stand and God didn't say, you know, go away, stop bothering me. Um, the same way with, with Job at times. And this is the Lord's answer in chapter 2. It's the revelation, and then it goes on to the five woes. And here's the revelation in chapter 2, 2. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. Now, some interpreters have said what they're going to do is put these on tablets. It's portable. They can run with it. That's not what it means at all. It means they're put on clay tablets so that they are passed out and handed down and read and memorized as portions of the Word of God. That's one of the reasons we found portions 
of the Word of God. And so this revelation was to last. Why? Because when Israel was in captivity, when, when Judah, the tribe of Judah, was in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, they needed to remember the words of Habakkuk. Guess what? We're going to look at it in a minute, but the words of Habakkuk in one passage are so important that it's repeated. That passage is repeated three times in the New Testament by the New Testament writers. So even though it's only three chapters long, Habakkuk was a pretty important book, not only for those surviving the Babylon, Babylonian captivity, but those who would come after as Christians. And for you and I today, that the way we measure faith, the way we live by faith. So he says, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it because it needed to be communicated without, throughout the kingdom. Bible knowledge commentary says this, the revelation awaits an appointed time. The prophecy pointed toward a future goal. Literally, the expression there is it pants toward the end, like a runner toward the finish line. Reference to the end seems significant to signify not only the coming destruction of evil Babylon or Babylonia, but the broader fulfillment of the messianic judgment in the fall of Babylon the Great. And when we did the book of Revelation, we looked at this in Revelation 17 and 18 at the close of the tribulation period. So it's not just the near prophecy that Habakkuk is talking about that says, yes, my nation's going to go into captivity for 70 years. Ezekiel and Daniel are going to go over to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar and the others are going to, to take over. And uh, the area around Jerusalem is going to be desolate with the exception of a few farmers and other individuals for that 70 years. But it goes beyond that. That, that God is saying when Jesus wraps up the whole thing at the end of the book of Revelation, there's a judgment on this evil empire Babylon. Well, where's Babylon today? Modern day Iraq, right, okay? Where was the Assyrian empire that came and scattered those 10 tribes in 722 BC? Where was that, um, that Assyrian empire? It was kind of right next door to Iran, all right? Now, go back with me. Some of you are too young to do this, but I'm not. I told you with the cornfield thing, I'm getting older and older. Go back with me to the 1970s. What was happening in the 70s besides the fact that I was sitting in gas lines when I was in college? Um, Jimmy Carter was in office, right? And what happened? I knew missionaries that were trapped in Iran at the time. And Ronald Reagan came along with his administration and he rescued them. History is important. So we, we have been dealing with Iran and Iraq for years, centuries, and God's not done with them yet. And they have been a cause, sadly, and it's not the people. There are, you know, you go to Turkey, there are wonderful people there that I've met. You go to Greece, there are wonderful people there that I've met. People that, they, they welcome you into your, their home, they feed you, they're just fantastic. But sometimes the governments are, are so corrupt and so bent on, you know, destroying everything Christian that uh, our world in America stands for. And so this is always going to be an issue. And then eventually that whole situation with the power struggle with Iraq. And, you know, you can say it'll be Iraq. You can say it'll be Iran. You can say it'll be China. You can say it'll be Russia. You can say it'll be North Korea. We don't know. This whole thing could go another thousand years. And we don't know. I, I can't imagine that. But we don't know. But we do know what God is doing. And the message to Habakkuk was, I'm going to do it. The message is, is from God is, is, I am going to have justice reign. I am going to sort things out. But right now, it's a bumpy road. Pick it up in chapter 2, verse 3. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks to the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. 
It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up, talking about Babylon. His desires are not upright. And then here's one of the key verses in the book of Habakkuk. And this is the passage that gets restated three times in the New Testament. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Other translations are the righteous will live by faith. The question is, is it my faith? Or is it God's faithfulness? Or is it both? You know, what you put your faith in is only as good as the foundation that it rests on. So I can have faith, and I've used this illustration before, and I think it came from C.S. Lewis. I can have faith that I'll get to heaven because I hang a fried egg over my ear and I leave it there for a month. None of you would talk to me if I did that, I'm sure have a rancid fried egg hanging over my ear. But you know, I could believe that with all my heart. I could be like Charlie Brown and the poster that I had as a teenager that said, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Well, you can be sincerely wrong. You can, you can put your hopes on something that's sincerely unstable and sincerely false. And in our day and age, there is no solid truth. You and I have the truth of the word of God. And so the question is, the righteous person or the righteous will live by faith. Is it your faith? And if it is, how faithful is the object of your faith? How solid is God? How right, how perfect, how just, how fair? So it's a combination of the whole thing. Now, I'll tell you in a moment what it's not saying. It's not saying that the righteous live by works, or by good deeds, or by good behavior. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 is quoted three times in the New Testament. And I want to take you there. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, First to the Jews, in other words, it was presented to the Jews first, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. That solid, faithful foundation that God is who he says he is, that he's our creator, and that he revealed himself in the scriptures, and he revealed himself in the person and life of Jesus Christ. That is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, and he quotes Habakkuk chapter 2. The righteous will live by faith. Paul is saying in Romans that you get justified before God at salvation by faith, but then you live out your life by faith. You don't just trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and then say, okay, I'm going to happily, merrily go on and live my life by my strength, by my ability. Because that's not what God designed. The righteous will live by faith, by God's faithfulness and by the faith that God gives us day by day as that grows. That's the first use of it in the New Testament, so it must be pretty important. Paul again in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10, and Paul is arguing in Galatians that it is not works that saves you, it is faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross that gets you to heaven. And he's saying that these Galatians who started out with their faith in Jesus Christ then tried to live their Christian life by works by trying to please God, by trying to do all kinds of things. And he says, that's not the way God designed it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. In other words, if you say, well, I'm a good Christian because I keep the law. I keep the Ten Commandments. He says, guess what? You're under a curse. You can't be right with God just by keeping the Ten Commandments. It's, it's, you can't even add the Ten Commandments on. You have to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. What's he saying? You and I would have to keep the law perfectly. Perfectly. Anybody ever tell a lie here? 
<laughs> besides the pastor? You, you know, yeah, I'm the first to admit it. So I broke, in that one commandment, I broke all the commandments. I cannot keep the law. And thank God that Jesus Christ forgives us and says, life is not for a Christian about keeping the law. Life is about walking with me and living as a righteous person by faith because I've imputed my righteousness to you. Otherwise, you have to do everything that's written. And you know, you take the Ten Commandments, that doesn't even include the 613 dietary laws and other customs and you know, how many of you do work on Sunday? Well, it would be Saturday actually, but how many of you do work on Saturday the Sabbath? You're violating the law if, if you're gonna be a law keeper. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because, and he quotes Habakkuk, the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Christ took our place so that we don't have to be law keepers. Now, should you be a law keeper? Yes, for a higher cause. You know, nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament in some form. Do you know which one is not? To keep the Sabbath, otherwise we'd all be here yesterday. No? That one is not reinstated. It was transferred to Sunday, the Resurrection Day. But we're still obligated to keep all of those things, but we don't keep them as law keepers. We keep them because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And even then, we fail. We fail. I'm probably going to tell a lie next week. All right? I won't tell you what it is, but so are you. You know? It's just a little fudge that, that you're going to say, you know? My wife says, did you eat a Taco Bell? No, dear, I didn't eat a Taco Bell, you know, or wherever I'm not supposed to be, that kind of thing. Um, that's a violation of the commandments. So the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a pole. Speaking of the crucifixion. The third one is over in the book of Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Some people think Paul did. Some people think Luke did. We do not know. When I get to heaven, I'm going to find out. And uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Here are people in Hebrews, and the theme of it is there are Jewish Christians who are about to give up. They're going to go back to Judaism. They're going to go back to law keeping. And he says, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Are you, are you on the edge right now? Like, man, this Christian thing, forget it. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. That God's going to wrap it up. That Jesus is going to return. And the world may be in chaos, probably will be in chaos at the time, but he's going to straighten it out. And he says this in verse 38, and by my right, but, and but my righteous one will live by faith. He's saying instead of being a Christian who gives up, you're one who hangs in there. You're one who lives by faith and by the faithfulness of God. And he says, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But then he says this to the Hebrews, but we do not belong to those who shrink back because we belong to Christ and are destroyed. Those who never trusted Christ in the first place, perhaps, but to those who have faith and are saved. And he's saying to the Hebrews, when you feel like giving up, how many excuses are there that, you know what, and you're, you're the good group because you're here, but how many times do you hear people like, well, you know, I got so many things going on in my life that I'm dealing with, I don't have time for church. I don't have time to stop and worship the Lord on a, on a Sunday morning or, or, you know, I can do it on my own, you know, in my own way. And some of that is true. I'm, I'm not negating that. But Hebrews says, don't forsake, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together because that was becoming the habit. 
be a family of God, particularly in times when we need to support one another, when we need to care about one another, when we need to encourage one another, because you look at the nightly news and you just want to throw up your hands and say, what's the use? You know? Bible Knowledge Commentary again says, the writer of Hebrews referred to this verse in his appeal for persecuted believers to persevere. We're not persecuted believers yet, but we could be. I read yesterday, I read the news all the time. I watch the news all the time. I probably shouldn't do that. But I read yesterday about a couple of Canadian pastors whose churches were shut down during COVID. And they got arrested and they got like heavy, I mean hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines, just, just with impunity, uh, placed on them by the Canadian government. And I think to myself, well, that can't happen here. But it can, it could. He's encouraging Christians to persevere because we don't know what it's gonna be like 10 years from now in America. I hope it's good. I hope the Lord's back by then. But we have no guarantees on any of that. In his quote, he stressed the messianic significance of this passage in Habakkuk. The day is coming when the King of Kings will reign on earth with perfect justice. The problem is Christians can't stick their head in the sand and say, I'm just going to wait till the Lord returns because it will all be better then. They have got to stand up for serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And that might be different for each different person. This concept, the righteous will live by faith. I want to suggest to you how the righteous are not to live, but often, quote, Christians try to live this way. Not by self-works, not by earning favor with God by what we do. Not by religious acts, okay? I'm glad you show up to church, but showing up to church and doing religious acts doesn't give you points for salvation. It might help your relationship with the living God. It might help your relationship with the family of God, but it's not, it's not a point earner, you know? You don't get a higher position in heaven because of your religious acts or your religious works and self-works and stuff like that, if that's what you think is gonna get you in. Not by a family Christian heritage. We have young people here, and their parents are Christian. And somehow, sometimes, these Christian kids grow up and they think, well, you know what, I'm a Christian because my family, they were Christian. It doesn't work that way. You don't lay your Christian kid's head on the pillow and by osmosis, all of a sudden, they're Christian. They have to make that same interaction with Jesus Christ. And you as family, you as teachers, need to teach them that we're only one generation away from Christianity being completely wiped out in our world if we don't teach our kids, if we don't have them singing in the choir, if we don't have them uh, opening the Bible once in a while, if we don't have uh, family talks where we go back and forth about, you know, what's really important in life, your faith. My son, years ago, when he started bodybuilding and working out, it was all, I mean, and these kids, when they get into it, they get into it, you know? And he was really buffing up and everything else. And I, I put a, a plaque on the wall in our home, and it was from Timothy. And Paul said to Timothy, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness has great gain. And I said to Matt, I said, I, I just want to remind you, that's what's really important. I'm thrilled that you're doing this. I'm thrilled if you're playing football or you're doing other sports or you're doing other things like that. But I want you to understand this is what really, really counts for eternity. And do all of that. Have your hobbies. My, my goodness, I have hobbies. I have a million hobbies. Nothing wrong with that. But at the center of it needs to be who you are as a Christian. Not by status, wealth, or education. Because you're well-educated, 
because you have money, because you, that doesn't make you a Christian. Not even by the merit of our own faith. And this is the one you've got to watch because sometimes faith can become a work. Sometimes faith can be the kind of thing where, where you look at your faith like God should count it as some kind of merit. Guess what? Any faith you have, now this is gonna really get into the foreordination and preordination and predestination theology of people, but any faith that you have, guess who gave it to you? It's a gift from God. In fact, Paul makes it really clear. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and sealed us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed by his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I would have never come to Jesus Christ if God didn't draw me. And I, I truly believe that he draws all people, and I don't know how all that works, that some reject and some don't. In comparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, the charity of God, through faith, and this, and I take it, grace and faith is not from yourself. What does he say? It is a gift of God. And you can say, well, he's talking about salvation there. But the whole package is God pours his grace on you. God draws you. He gives you the faith to respond, to understand that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And he is the one who forgives sins. He is the one who went to the cross. And he is the one that you and I need to embrace and live by faith before and the righteous will live by his faithfulness and our faith that was given to us by a gift of God. Which means when you look at the world scene like Habakkuk was, what are you going to see? Was Habakkuk terrified that the Babylonians were coming? Was he terrified that that would be the end of everything? No. He didn't take it lightly. But he looked on with confidence because he said, I know there's an ending coming and I know I'm eternal and I know I will be with Christ eternally and this might be a tough time to go through, but we're gonna make it. And no matter how the United States turns upside down or right side up or what happens, if you know Christ as your savior and you walk with him, you're gonna make it. And you and I are going to be on the other side of eternity, and we're going to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's not by works, so that you and I can't boast. Don't worry about what's going on in the world scene. Do everything you can to change it in your family, in your community. But don't worry about it, because God's got it covered. What does he say? It will surely happen. He's going to deal. We'll look at the five woes next week. And he's going to deal with those nations and those people and those government systems that are antithetical to Christianity.